Turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 6, continuing our verse-by-verse study through the New Testament. Uh, Deuteronomy will be in chapter 24 this coming week, so I want to encourage you to uh, pray about coming out on Thursday nights. The Old Testament rocks, amen? Amen. It's good stuff. I want to encourage you that every chapter in the Old Testament points to Jesus, and whatever you're doing on Thursday night, please come. We would love to have you join us for a time, that time of fellowship. Before I get into the text, just quickly, I did my dad's memorial service last Saturday. It was amazing. Uh, there were about 400 people that showed up, and uh, I said to, to, to some people that it felt like a taste of what heaven will be like when we get there. Because there were 400 people, many of whom I hadn't seen in years. We all have a common love for the Lord, a common love for my dad, but a common love for the Lord. And everybody was just loving on each other. And the service went from 1 to 3, and I was still there at 8 o'clock. Just hanging out with people, loving on people. And then the next day, I taught at the church I pastored for 10 years that I hadn't taught at in 7 years. So it was a pretty emotional weekend, but it was a blessing. We weep and rejoice at the same time. Amen? I'm so glad my dad's in heaven. I miss him every day. It was powerful. There were, I think there were maybe 15 pastors there, and uh, there were videos sent from all over, the, all over the world from different people, Costa Rica, and, play, and Danny Lehman sent one that we actually showed, and uh, he's the head of YWAM, Youth with a Mission, and my dad was the one, he said, you know, you're, he said, Johnny Johnston was the Chuck Smith of Santa Cruz. When he got to town, he said, we were all in the hyper-shepherding movement, if you know what that is, and we were all chasing a bunch of funky doctrines. We are a bunch of hippies off the beach trying to figure out what Christianity was like. And Johnny Johnston showed up and said, we're just going to teach the Word of God and the goodness of God. And out of that came missionaries all over the world, lives being changed. It was powerful. And so, guys, you know, it's awesome to know that we can invest in eternity. Amen. And my dad's heart was always, it's not about the temporary, it's about the eternal. We don't invest in stuff, we invest in souls, amen? We want to see people come to know Jesus Christ. So I'm certainly blessed that he was my dad, and I'm so thankful he's in heaven. If you think about it, do pray for my mom. Mary, last Sunday when I taught at Calvary Chapel Santa Cruz was their 60th wedding anniversary. And so my mom, as you can imagine, 60 years with the only man she's ever loved, having a hard time but God is with her as well. Amen? Amen. So if you think about it, I really appreciate it. Pray for my mom, Ola B. Now she's from the South. All right. All right. So Acts chapter 6, raising godly servants. Raising godly servants. We've been going through the book of Acts, and as we've seen in the book of Acts, it really describes the birth of the church. So we have the Gospels, and in the Gospels, Jesus is, we, we find out who Jesus is and why he came and how he lived and what he taught and the good news of the gospel. We have four different accounts, and now we get to the book of Acts. Jesus has ascended back into heaven. He has left the Holy Spirit. He told them to go wait for not many days from now. The Holy Spirit shall come upon you. He was already in them. He had been breathed in them in the gospels. Now the Holy Spirit came upon them, and it says you shall have power, as we've talked about. The word there is dunamis, a dynamic power filled with the Holy Spirit. And what did it do? It transformed these guys from men of sleep to men of prayer from men of fear to men of faith, from men who cowered in, in, in times of difficulty and trials to men who stood firm and had great boldness. In Acts chapter 2, we saw Peter, who when we saw him at the end of the Gospels, was running away, hiding, getting up and preaching with great boldness, and 3,000 people getting saved in a single day. What happened to Peter? The Holy Spirit happened to Peter. Then we saw walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. And then we saw what happens to the church as we walk in the Spirit. And part of what happens is we face persecution and trials happen. And so that brings us to chapter 6. And now as we get to chapter 6, there's more practical issues taking place because the church has grown from 120 to thousands. The church had been added to, now it's multiplying. And as the church grows, there are concerns even Christians began to have disagreements with each other. Hard to imagine, amen? But God raises up leaders within the church, raises up servants within the church, so the church can function properly. And that's what we're going to see in Acts chapter 6. Let's go over the outline, then we'll pray and dig in. So I titled the message, Raising Up Godly Servants. As a church grows, so does the need for servants. You know that it's twofold. The more people you have, the more servants you need, and the more servants you have, the more people will show up. Just amazing how that works when people are faithfully serving in ministry. You know, we've, this little church here, we've been here four years, we've probably had, I'm just guessing, I don't know, 1,500 people come through here. 
They don't all stay. Amen? Obviously. Amen? But people come through, and, and a lot of it, sometimes they're just visiting, sometimes the pastor's just too radical for them or whatever, or, or they don't, you know, but a lot of times it's just the ministries that they're looking for aren't there. Well, you know, you don't have a youth group, you don't have this, you don't have that. And, there's, and there even can be a shopper mentality. I'm not even saying it's wrong for some people that say, you know, we love the church, but they've got better stuff for my kids down the street, and they go. But you know how that gets changed? When people here feel called by God when they see a need to step up and fill it. So when people show up, they're ministered to. Amen? And that's what happens in tonight's text, in a way. We're going to see how that happens and who those people should be that are serving in the church. So first we're going to see responding to the physical needs of the body. You recognize a need within the church, and then you have to have a heart to serve. Guys, often we see needs and we love to tell someone else they need to do it. Amen? Hey, Pastor Dave, you know what we really need? I said, before you finish that sentence... You recognized it, which means you get to be a part of the solution, so go. Because <laughs> too often it's, well, you need to, and you need to, and you need to. And can I encourage you? We're going to see in tonight's text, you know what I'm called to do? Preach the word, pray, and love the people. That's my calling right there. And you know what? I love to do those things. I'm not supposed to be the entire church by any stretch. You have gifts I don't have. I have gifts you don't have. We minister to each other. Amen? That's the body of Christ. And I need to be faithful to what I'm called to do, and you need to be, we all need to be faithful to what we're called to do. That's how the body of Christ functions. And so we're going to see that in tonight's text, that first, responding to the physical needs. Remember, they've all come from great distances, and they, they were there for the Feast of Pentecost, and many of them get saved. A lot of them didn't even go home. They all came together and sold everything and kind of put their money in the apostles' hands, and then they were being cared for that way. And we're going to see that there's some people that feel like they're being left out and they're not being cared for properly. We're going to see how they address that. The second thing we're going to see is being available to be used by God as He chooses. By the way, if you're truly a servant, you don't tell the master what you're willing to do. Amen? I'm your servant, but only if I get to do this. Otherwise, I'm not interested. If you're really a servant, it's, Lord, here I am, use me. Amen? The eyes of the Lord search to and fro among the whole earth, seeking one he can show himself strong on account of, one whose heart is loyal to him or faithful to him. God's not looking for a better method. He's not looking for a better building. He's looking for men and women who are willing to be used for his kingdom and for his glory. Amen? And if you're that person, Lord, use me. I'll do whatever you want me to do. And what's amazing is we start being faithful in the small things. God tends to use us in even greater things. Amen? We're going to see that in tonight's text. And we're going to see the example in Stephen. And we're going to see next week in chapter 7, uh, one of my dad's favorite chapters in the entire Bible, where Stephen's testimony. And we're going to see just how God uses a man like that. We'll see that being available to use by God, he must be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And know too that as you're faithful in the small things, God will use you in the greater things. Let's pray and we'll dig into the text. Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you, we love you. And Lord, just as the elders and the pastors and the deacons and the servants, all of them needed the infilling of your Holy Spirit to be effective at all, so too must your Holy Spirit be active in this message this morning. Lord, this is, if it's the words of man, this is a waste of time. So we ask that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher. And I pray for everyone who's here. Give us ears to hear and not try to apply this message to someone else's life, to apply it to our own. And Lord, I pray you would stir up gifts. You'd stir people up that have a calling on their life to go beyond thinking about doing it and to step out in faith to be used for your kingdom and for your glory. So, Lord, be our teacher this morning. Be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. All right, Acts chapter 6. So, raising up godly servants. Again, a church that grows is going to have needs. Let's begin there again. It's grown from 120 to over 5,000, and probably even more than that at this point. And it says there in verse 1, Now in those days, when the number of disciples was multiplying... There arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. So now in those days, the church is young, church is months old, 
And as the church is only months old and it's exploding, they're still being sensitive to what the Lord's calling them to do. But as it's growing at a very rapid rate, notice here, it said there in Acts chapter two, and the Lord added daily those who are being saved. Now it says the church is multiplying. I'm kind of a math guy. Multiplying grows quicker than adding. Amen? So the church was being added to, and now the church is multiplying. It went from being added to slowly to multiplying, and as it's growing quickly, the needs are going to be great. You know, it's interesting. I've been a part of, on staff at four different Calvary chapels now, and each one that I was, they were all uniquely different. I was, well, I, I was a part of uh, the church plant my dad, but I wasn't on staff. I got to watch that grow from five people to a thousand. I was in Lancaster, watched it grow from five people to about a thousand. I was in San Jose where the church was about 3,000 people. Then I was in Santa Cruz, watched it grow from five to a large church. And, and what's interesting, there are people that are never satisfied no matter how big the church is. If the church is 40 people, why don't you have more services? When the church gets to 400, they go, I remember when it was 40 and we all knew each other. I wish it was 40 again. When it gets to, and as the church grows, then people say, well, there's all these needs. Well, guess what? Guess who the servants are? Amen. Amen. It's us. And God has equipped you and called you and uniquely gifted you. And if the church is going to be ministered to, all of us need to use our gifts. A healthy church will grow in number because healthy sheep beget healthy sheep. You know the number one way the church grows? It's not advertising on the, it's not, you know what it is? When you're on fire for God, you're contagious. Amen? When you're, when you, most people come to church because somebody invited them. By the way, pray for us. They're not letting us put our signs out anymore. City of Calabasas came and collected them all, took them all away, and then gave them back to us, but said if they see them on the street again, they're going to find the, the uh, community center. So we only, we only put one right on the property here. You know what? That means we got to tell more people. Amen. We got to be the sign. It's over there. I've even thought, you know, we should just have someone standing out on the corner with one of those spinning <laughs> Calvary Chapel, eating Jesus. It's that way. Amen. But the point is that a healthy church grows because when people love the Lord, they're contagious. And we're going to see that even in tonight's text because, you know, when someone's really on fire for God, you can't help but notice. Amen? And this church has be gone beyond simple addition. In the Bible, there's addition. We saw in chapter 5 there was subtraction, Ananias and Sapphira. Amen? So there's addition, there's subtraction, and there's multiplication in the Word of God. And again, the church was exploding, and the key reason was the unashamed, bold preaching of the gospel. Amen? Amen? The word of God was being taught. It was not being watered down. One of the things that happened on Sunday was really encouraging is a lot of the people that had, the church that I pastored had gotten, has gotten very small and a lot of them came back. I didn't advertise it, but a lot of them came back because I hadn't seen them in years. And I was really strengthened and encouraged to see how many people and be reminded of how many people had gotten saved in that church. People have said, you know, I got saved here, Pastor Dave. I got saved here in, you know, in the year 2001. I've been walking with the Lord ever since, and person after person after person. And people, their walks with God, they've grown. There's so many people that have become pastors in our ministry, people in the mission field. And I'm thinking, you know what? That is all the credit to the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Amen? Amen? And too many churches today, we water it down, and we don't want to offend anybody. And, you know, you might want to maybe think about possibly at some point considering Get right with Jesus, amen? <laughs> right, amen? Exhort people. Teach the word of God with boldness. Don't be ashamed of it. And that's why the church was exploding. But with that blessing also came some difficulties, also came some obstacles. So the key reason was the unashamed preaching of the word of God, and even though they had been threatened, remember they told them, if you do this anymore, we're gonna throw you in prison. And they scourged them and sent them home, left, let them go, and when they went back, what did they do? They were praising God that they had the privilege to be beaten for the gospel's sake. You know how you stop people like that? You don't, amen? And we need some more of that. We, oh, I stopped sharing my faith because my neighbor doesn't talk to me at the mailbox anymore. We think that's persecution. 
They were scourged, they were beaten, and then you know what they prayed for? They didn't say, Lord, take away the persecution. They said, Lord, give me the strength to stand in the midst of the persecution, amen? So I want to be encouraged by that. So they were remaining faithful, they're making disciples, they're not just attracting a crowd. We know in the last chapter they said, you filled all of Jerusalem with your doctrine. Wouldn't it be great to fill all of Calabasas and Agora Hills and Woodland Hills and Oak Park and Thousand Oaks and every city that surrounds us with the doctrine of the gospel? Amen? It's one of the reasons we're on the radio. It's going out to thousands of people every single day. And praise God for that. So the church is effective and growing. It's being used mildly by God. And you can expect that the enemy's not going to just sit by and watch. What's going to happen? You're going to have outward attacks of persecution. You're going to have inward attacks of hypocrisy, Ananias and Sapphira. But then you're going to have inward problems where people in the church aren't getting along. And they're going to feel slighted. And guess what? That's why we're going to see Acts chapter 6. We'll see in this morning's text, division is something that could start taking place. Satan hates Jesus. He hates his bride. He hates his church. He hates you. He wants to bring division. Lord, help us not to allow that to take place here. Amen? If you've got a problem with me, tell me. Please. I'm an approachable guy. I really am. You all have my cell phone number. I'm not hiding. I love you. If you feel like there's something I'm doing or saying that you don't agree, come talk to me. And we should do that with each other. Amen? Instead of leaving or being angry or being embittered, that's, that's the world. That's not the body of Christ. And again, the attack on the church is not going to stop until we get to heaven. It's just not going to. Until the day that Satan is cast into hellfire forever, he's already attempted to intimidate the church through threats and beating and jailed, to corrupt the church with Ananias and Sapphira, and with these strategies being unsuccessful, he now tries to divide and conquer within the church by there being disagreements over things that are important, but again, are not eternal. Again, with more opportunity comes with more people comes more opportunity to be used by God, but also more of an opportunity to people feel, to feel slighted by the Lord or by the people. I've been a pastor long enough that I've had a lot of people leave churches I've pastored not happy with me. And sometimes, rightfully so, okay, can happen. But sometimes, I, I ran into a guy this last weekend that left the church I pastored because I walked by him one Sunday morning and didn't hug him. And he left. He thought I was ignoring him. He just told me this weekend. I'm like, really? Now you know I'm hugging every single one of you. <laughs> Amen? You're getting a hug, whether you want one or not, in Jesus' name. But he left because I didn't hug him. He felt like I ignored him, and I'm thinking, wow, that's tragic. That's sad. Amen? Let's not be so easily offended. Amen? Let's not allow ourselves to allow something small like that to cause us to bring division in the body of Christ. Well, the issue they're dealing with here isn't that small it, in, its, in one sense. It says there, you've got a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists. So let's describe those. The Hebrews were the Jews who had grown up in Israel, and they spoke largely Aramaic or Hebrew, but they were the ones that grew up in Israel. The Hellenists were ones who grew up in the Greek culture, who were also Jewish, but had a different cultural background, spoke a different language. Now they've all come together to form one church, and the guys who are overseeing the church, largely, are the Hebrews, right? They're guys who speak. And so the Hellenists, when they were dividing and giving out the daily, so evidently what was happening as they gathered everything up, the people would come for their daily portions of food, those who had need. It was kind of the church was the way that they distributed it. And so people were coming and they felt like the Hebrew widows and women and orphans or whoever were getting a bigger portion than the ones who had a Greek background. And so they came and they made a complaint saying, well, our people aren't getting as much food as your people, and so they're feeling slighted, and now there's an opportunity for division in the church. How do we deal with that? What do we do next? So the Jews who had embraced the Jewish culture are the ones that we see there are the Hebrews, and then we know the Hellenists, again, are those. And it says in Acts 4, they had all things in common, and they came daily for their food distribution. So they came, and sometimes it was clothing, it was Again, the conflict between the Christians and Satan loves to use this kind of conflict to bring division in the body and cause people to leave offended. Now, the Hellenists had a complaint, but notice they didn't storm in angry. There's a, it just brought up, hey, we feel like we're being slighted. 
hey, what can we do? How do we fix this? They brought their concern to the apostles. And the truth is, again, when a church is growing, expectations on those in positions of authority grow with it. And they expect, you know, it's been said that right now is one of the hardest times in human history to be a pastor. Why? Because people have an expectation of a pastor to be like a CEO. They expect him to work 48 hours a day, and there's only 24. Uh, They expect him to be at every hospital visit, to counsel every single person in the church, to make sure that he studies 50 hours a week so he can teach the Word of God, but also make sure that he works a job to provide for himself. And you go down the list, and and there's these expectations that some have placed upon them. And I want to just encourage you. I love you enough to tell you this. I don't do this to please you. I do this to please God. And if I'm honoring him, I'll be a blessing to you. Amen? And so if people say, well, I think you should be doing this. If God hasn't told me to do it, I'm not doing it. Amen? Now, that being said, I'm available. You can call me anytime. Some of you have called me at 2 in the morning. I answer the phone. Amen? If you call me during the day, if I'm with a customer because I have a full-time job, I will call you back. I love you guys. I'm here to serve you. You're not here to serve me. I'm your servant. That's my heart. That's my passion. So the expectations are raising up. Now the apostles, these 12 guys who just a few months earlier were hiding now have thousands of people who they're shepherding. And it's too much. They're called to do one thing, study the word, pray, be faithful to that. And now all these things are coming up, they're gonna have to raise up more leaders. Verse two. Then the 12 summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Now I wanna say this. Serving tables is just as high a calling as teaching the Word of God. They're both important, but if somebody who's supposed to be teaching the Word of God is spending all of his time serving tables, then the message on Sunday is going to be weak. Amen? He's not going to be prepared. He's not going to be prayed up. His focus is to be on the spiritual. And then there are those whose focus is to be on the practical. And that's how the body of Christ works. So it's not wrong that we all have different gifts. Remember that the early church, Acts 2.42, the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. That's the church right there. Apostles' doctrine, word of God. Breaking of bread, that is Lord's Supper. It could also be communion, but it can also speak of like an agape feast. Uh, Fellowship, having, having things in common loving on each other, ministering to each other, and prayer. That's the church. Now, many churches have become support groups, aerobic classes, rock concerts, healing crusades, potluck dinners, political rallies. And again, I'm not even saying some of that's even wrong, but that's a sidebar to what the church can be, but that's not what the church is called to be primarily. Amen? And too many churches now are more about political rallies or more about uh, you know, concerts or outreaches than they are about making disciples. And God's called us to make, you know who votes, right? Disciples. Amen? People who know the word of God, it changes how they do everything. And so they needed to be faithful and focus what the church was about, not what the world wanted the church to be. God's word was the priority in the first century church, and it must be the priority in the church today. Amen? Why do we have so many churches that have gone off the path, that have lost their way, They've gone away from the word of God. You have churches today rejecting the resurrection, rejecting the word of God, denying the deity of Christ, saying there's many other paths to the Lord. Guess what? That's not a church, that's a cult. Amen? When you reject the resurrection, you reject reject Jesus Christ. Amen? So guys, he's the way, he's the truth, it's only him, and so that needs to be the focus of the church, the same focus of the first century church. Again, there's many important ministries in the church, including waiting tables, but the apostles would not forsake the high, their highest calling, which is to teach God's word and you know, to go and oversee the secondary issues as far as the practical things. They're not called by God to do everything in the church, and neither are pastors today. Every pastor should have a servant's heart. Everybody in ministry should have a servant's heart, and we'll see that in this morning's text. But guys, here's the truth. For a pastor to be effective, he must learn to give ministry away. You know, when I stepped down as pastor in Santa Cruz, stepped aside because of issues with my sons and everything else, 
You know, there were nine pastors on staff and any one of them could have taken the church because we're called to make disciples and to give ministry away and to prepare people. If the ministry is all focused on one person, then that's wrong. Amen? If one personality leaves and the church crumbles, that church was never built on Christ to begin with. Amen? The whole body of Christ functions when all of us use our gifts. So the apostles were not going to leave their calling, but they recognized that they needed to raise others up. So notice what happens in verse 3. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, who you may appoint over this business. Following the example of Exodus 18, when Moses was overwhelmed in his attempt to minister to three million whiners in the desert, amen, and he's got three million people, and it was his father-in-law Jethro who came to him and said, what you're trying to do, it's too much, and you need to appoint people so that they can do ministry as well. And I want to say this, the pastor should be approachable but you should also be willing to have someone else minister to you. Amen? Too often what will happen, as our church got very large in Santa Cruz, everybody wanted only to counsel with me. And I'm like, we've got nine pastors. And they're called and gifted by God with the same Holy Spirit that I have. And I get it, because I'm the guy in the front, and I'm always the guy on the radio or whatever. And I'm not, not that I'm not available, but we need to be willing to recognize that other people are just as called and just as gifted as the one person you want to talk to. Amen? And so the body of Christ needs to function that way. Because if it's all put on one person... It's going to be flawed because that one person doesn't have every gift, and that one person can't be everywhere at one time. So they, were, they called people to free up Moses. So now here that same model. The word deacon, what these are here in this text, the word means servant. Diakonos means servant, focusing on meeting the physical needs of the body. And it's just as high a calling as a pastor or an elder or anybody else in the church. It's a high calling. It's just got a different focus. Both needed for the church to function as it should. While not all deacons become pastors, most pastors I know began there. They started off being a servant. Just, what can I do? When I started attending Calvary Chapel Antelope Valley, I was in my early 20s. People used to always ask me, are you going to be a pastor like your dad? And my, my answer was always, no way. No, I'm not called. That's my dad. That's not me. I'm a businessman. I love the Lord. I will serve in the church any way I can. We started attending Calvary Chapel Antelope Valley. When we got there, there was a need in the two and three-year-old class. So my wife and I were teaching the two and three-year-old class, and we taught it the entire 10 years we were there. At the same time when I was a youth pastor, we still had one service. There was two services. We taught the two and three-year-olds, and we loved it. And then I saw that there was a need on the setup team to come early and set up chairs. So I started coming and being part of the setup team setting out the tarp and setting up the chairs and setting up the sound system and getting church ready. And then later on, there was, you know, as more needs would come, God would put it on my heart to be involved, and I loved doing all that, and I thought that's who I was going to be, and that's a high calling. Amen? Amen? If I did that the rest of my life, that would have been just great. But God had another calling. But what happens is God stirs you up, and he starts to use you, and the person that becomes available will always be used by the Lord. The deacons do their job to free up those who have other callings to do what they are called to do. So what can you do to help? Well, look around and where you see that there's a need, and that's usually the sign of a great calling, is you recognize something's needed. And you think, I can do that. I can help with that. And we'll see that as we continue through the text. But I want you to notice the qualifications for servants. It isn't just anybody with a pulse. Amen? Oh, you can breathe in and out. Can you fog the mirror? Great. You're in charge of. And just because it's something practical, and you might even be a gourmet chef in your real job, and then we need someone to help cook for something, you may still not be the right person. Guys, because there's qualifications spiritually even to do practical things. And we see it right here in the text. Because you know what? I want spirit-filled people handing out bulletins. Amen? I want spirit-filled people putting out the signs when they used to let us. Amen? I want spirit-filled people working on the bulletins. I want spirit-filled people, working, spirit-filled people ministering to our children. 
Amen? It's not just what your physical qualifications are. What is your spiritual calling? And notice that it's very clear here. It says, of good reputation filled with the Holy Spirit. The word good reputation there is, means blameless. It means without accusation from the outside. It's somebody you look at. It doesn't mean they're sinless or nobody would be qualified. Amen? But what it means is that, you, and it's been said, if you take care of your character, God will take care of your reputation. Amen? You be faithful. You be the same person at home that you are at church. You seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And you know what? You will have a godly reputation before men. Not perfect, but a godly reputation. Somebody who's without accusation. When they see you, they don't say, oh, there's that philanderer. Oh, there's that thief. Oh, there's that drunkard or whatever. You don't have that reputation. You have a reputation. So before someone can serve in the most practical way, they needed to be filled with this Holy Spirit. And I love that picture. But not only does it say, of good reputation, and, but full of the Holy Spirit, again, the Holy Spirit under the Holy Spirit's uh, control, but also wisdom, gifted with wisdom, more than a servant that sees what needs to be done, but knows how to respond, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. So both spiritually and practically minded, and not only filled with the Spirit and knowing the Word of God, but how to apply the Word of God in a given circumstance. I thought of this this morning when I was going over my notes. A few months back, we had a, a young man here who, uh, won't give too many details as to, because he's not here, but he was visiting or he had been coming and he was kind of out of control a little bit during worship and being distracting. And I noticed there was a, a new family right behind this young man and he was just kind of out of control and uh, it needed to be dealt with. And I ran to grab Joshua because I was getting ready to teach and I said, Hey, Josh, can you, Joshua, can you come back and, but before I could even do that, Eric got up and went over and talked to the guy, put his arm around him, and, and you know what that is? That's being led by the Holy Spirit, amen? And he didn't harm, he just put his arm around him, hey, how you doing, bro, are you okay? You know, and talked to him and encouraged him, I don't know if you remember that, Eric, but you know what? That's the body of Christ functioning where you see a need and you have the wisdom to apply the right way to respond to it, amen? And if everybody just waits for the pastor to do it, not a lot's gonna get done. There's only one, you know, we've got three pastors. There's just a few of us, amen? We're all the body of Christ, amen? And we all have gifts, and we all need to be sensitive and practically minded when we see a need. You know, you know when you can usually tell who the servants are? You're sitting in church and someone spills their coffee. Amen? amen? And you see, that, you see the servants jump up and go get rags, right? Is that not what happens? You just, boom, there's, pe there's some people who go, wow, that's too bad. And there's other people <laughs> that get up and want to fix it. And it's just the, that calling and that gifting by God to, to apply it. Guys, it is a hard combination to find. Somebody's practically minded and spirit-filled. But you know what? That's what our God does. And that's the gifting that our God gives to each of us. These were men who were called and gifted by God and the Lord wanted his people to be ministered to by godly people. He had high standards for just waiting tables. Spiritually called, equipped and gifted, and again, would need wisdom, especially in this case with dealing with the widows. So now you have two factions coming up and we're not getting enough and you get plenty. And here they are and the deacons have to deal with that and they have to take the word of God and they have to be able to apply it with wisdom so that they're ministered to, and the disagreement is dealt with. Amen? That's how the body of Christ should function. So apostles, unlike Jewish religious leaders, I love this, I want to point this out, they had no problem giving ministry away. Remember the religious leaders, what did they do? I want to be in charge. I want to be in the front. Nobody else knows anything but us. You have to only come to us. Only we can pray for you. Only we know the truth. You can't even have access to the word. Only we can interpret it. Only we can read it. Only we can understand it. But you know what the apostles wanted to do? Give ministry away. Allow people to use their gifts. Amen? And that's the mark of somebody who gets it. Guys, if you're holding on to everything, if your ministry is threatened by somebody else, you don't understand that you're called. Amen? Do you know there are pastors that will get upset if you're gonna plant a church within 50 miles of them because they think you might take some of their sheep? 
I'm just being transparent with you. When I moved, when, when Don McClure sent me to Santa Cruz, there were three pastors in town up in arms and couldn't believe that I was coming to town because, you know, they've got 80 people in their church and there's only 400,000 people, but we got a church of 80, so you stay out of town. And the reality is if somebody came and wanted to plant a church in this building and meet in the room down the hall, I would say, praise God. Because it's not about building our church, it's about building the kingdom. And if you know that you're called, you're not threatened by someone else's calling. You know who's threatened? Somebody who's insecure in the fact that they've been called by God. Amen? See, apostles are like, give it away. Let more people be involved. Let's raise some people up. Let's get some other godly people. They didn't say, you know, we're the 12. Now the 11, because, you know, Judas, not so much. But, you know, we're the 11, and, you know, we got patches that say the 11. And, you know, only we can do anything. These guys were not like the Sanhedrin. They were not like the religious leaders. They wanted to give ministry away. Can I tell you that nothing brings greater joy to my heart than to see people step out in faith and use their gifts for God's glory and to be used in the ministry. What a blessing that is. Amen? Amen? Okay. So God had gifted more than the apostles. And so here, too, here at Calvary Chapel, Calabasas, God has gifted more than just the pastors or the worship team. He's not looking for ability, but availability, and God wants to use you. Being a deacon, there's even deaconesses in the Bible, is a high calling with a promise. It says in 1 Timothy 3, for those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in faith, which is in Christ Jesus. There's a blessing to obedience, amen? There's a blessing to faithfully serving. Verse four says there, but we will give ourselves. So a point, we need to raise up spirit-filled men to take over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and ministry of the word. Guys, the word of God was the priority for the apostles and it should be the priority of every pastor. I don't play golf. I don't have time. I'm studying my Bible. Amen? If you're a pastor and you play golf, God bless you, but I don't know where you get that time. But you know what? Understanding the Word of God, rightly dividing the Word of God, and it's not just for Sunday morning when you teach it, but then having the wisdom to be able to counsel people and to minister to people. Amen? Where does that come from? Guys, you don't have wisdom from a book that if you don't read it. Amen? The Word of God's not going to flow out of your mouth if it's not being put into your heart as you open it up and read it. Amen? The word of God transforms lives and the pastor's calling and the apostle's calling was to focus on the word of God. You know what? It would be impossible for them to focus on the word of God were it not for these other humble servants, godly men who are willing to serve in the practical ministry. Now, I'm gonna share just a, a, this is a, a philosophy of ministry that I have, just Pastor Dave's opinion. And this is the analogy I used to use. Be a sharpshooter, not a machine gunner. What does that mean? Too many people are involved in 25 ministries poorly in all of them. Amen? And I'm going to tell you, I was the first guy in line. At Calvary Antelope Valley, oh, you need, oh, I can do that. Oh, you need, oh I can do that too. I can, oh, I can do that. Oh, you need, the, you need the church insulated. I've never done that. I'll read a book. I can do that. You know what I mean? And the reality is there's some that just raise their hand for everything, and that was me, you know, zealous. I just want to serve. I want to serve. Here's the reality. If I do everything, then other people do nothing and I don't do it well, amen? But if God has a calling on your life, be faithful to that. And a burden is a spawning ground of a calling. A need doesn't equate to a calling. You can drive home today and see 150 needs. It doesn't mean you're called to all 150 of those things. It's impossible, amen? Hey, my heart breaks when I hear about different things that are happening, in and I'd love to go help everyone, but I can't, and neither can you. So we need to be faithful to what we're called to do and do it in a way that honors the Lord, and then let other people do what they're called to do. Amen? So you be faithful. So don't try to do 50 things a little bit. We're the same way with missions. You know, we, it's Bayamba, it's Reach Boulder. You know, we pick three or four things, and then we give a lot as opposed to 100 things giving a little. I want to be focused, Amen? And that's the calling that God has upon our lives. If you try to do it all, you'll be ineffective. If you see a need, again, pray about it. Ask God to direct you. God, where God guides, God provides. Nobody called to oversee a ministry, again, is going to be able to do it in their own strength. But if God calls you, God will equip you. 
Amen? He doesn't call the equipped, he equips the called. Amen? If you step out, well, I'm not, but I know the Lord, so I'm going to go for it. When I became a youth pastor, I had taught zero Bible studies in my life. Zero. And I'm a youth pastor. Really? Okay. Teenagers, on purpose. <laughs> Amen? And I went in and sat down that first week, and there were six girls at the table. I'm 23 years old with six teenage girls teaching them the Bible. Three weeks later, the pastor didn't show up, got caught in traffic, and I was teaching on a Wednesday night with five minutes notice. Thanks. I've taught three Bible studies to six girls. Now I'm teaching the whole church with five minutes notice. I don't like teaching with five minutes notice now. <laughs> Amen? I want to study, right? Point is that you be available. Ask God to gift you to do what he's called you to do. Step out in faith. Be faithful to that and watch what God will do. Amen? Dig a well, verse 5. The saying pleased the whole multitude. So they got up and said, look, we need people to serve so we can focus on the word. And you know what? Everyone was happy because they said, you're right. You guys need to focus on the word so you can teach us the word. You need to focus on prayer and pray for us. You need to be spiritual leaders in the church. And so we're going to raise up practical leaders. We say amen to that. We agree with that. And then it says, the saying pleased the whole multitude. They chose Stephen a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmius, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. Stephen, as we will see next chapter, is the first martyr of the Christian faith. And we're going to see him preach a message with incredible boldness. But do you know that he's a deacon in the church? And I love that. This is a guy who waits tables who's filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen? He's the guy who's coming early and setting up chairs at church who's filled with the Holy Spirit. And just because he's a man who sets up chairs doesn't mean he's not going to be a man who has an opportunity to preach with boldness. Amen? And we're going to see that just because God has called you to this doesn't mean God has more. It doesn't mean that you're not going to have opportunities to be a witness. We're all called to be witnesses. Amen? And so here's the exhortation. He was a man of great faith. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see later that his face shone like an angel. He later, we're going to see next week, I'm going to give you a preview. He gets a standing ovation from Jesus. Amen. Amen. Anything better than that? I'm giving next week away, but hopefully you already read it anyway. Amen. But Stephen's preaching with boldness. He won't waver, so they're gonna, they stone him to death. The Bible says that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, and when Stephen looks up, he sees Jesus standing to welcome him into heaven. Guys, I want to live a life that gets a standing ovation from Jesus. How about you? And so this is Stephen. He's a waiter tables at the church. He's willing to do whatever's practical. He's ministering to the, to the women who are having a conflict. He's willing to just be a servant. That should be everybody in the building, amen? And he's got a servant's heart. 1 Timothy 3.13, for those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Philip, Acts chapter 8, we're going to see him. He's on this list. He's an evangelist. He preached Christ in Samaria. Multitudes were saved. He leads the Ethiopian eunuch to the Lord. He baptizes him. He preaches in every city from uh, Azotus to Caesarea. He's with great boldness. So guess where his ministry started? Practically serving in the local church. Guys, I love that picture that that's how it starts. He had four daughters who prophesied. He began with a heart willing to serve. Procurus, it's not mentioned other, but in church history, it says he became uh, John the Apostle's assistant. And then he was a pastor, uh, again, of a large growing church and was martyred for his faith. Where did it begin? With a heart willing to serve in the local church. Often people feel called to, to ministry, but they want a full-time position in the church. I've had this happen more times than I can count. Someone will come up, I feel really called. What does the job pay? Bro, I have a job. This is not, and people feel called because they haven't been able to find work. So maybe let's go work at the church. We don't want you if that's your attitude. Amen. You know what? People who are called will serve if it costs them something. And often it does. 
Amen? Sacrificial, turning on down extra shifts at work so they can serve in the body of Christ, making him the priority and the passion of their life. Again, let's invest not in stuff, but in souls. Amen? And here's that picture of these men who are being called to, to serve in the cleaning ministry, in the setup ministry, to, to serve in dealing with disputes among the, the people in a practical way. And again, God usually brings people up by having them start off teaching the two and three year old class. Amen? Or bringing you know, food for the church or handing out bulletins or doing something simple. Now, what's interesting is you read the rest of these names, every one of these names is a Greek name. This is wisdom. Because the, pro- the, the people that were having a problem were the Greek Christians, the Hellenists. And so what did they do? They raised up seven men who were of their tribe in a sense. And so they were then ministering to those who were struggling. You know, our God is a God of order. Amen? And he's going to put people in positions to minister to people who are willing to receive it from them. So those who had the complaint were now going to be ministered to by people from, that have the same background as them who are then able to pour into their heart. Look what it says there in verse 6. When they sat before the apostles and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Here's what happens. So they bring these seven men in before the apostles. They pray over, they prayed about it. It was confirmed by the Lord. And then they laid hands on them, which was signifying to everyone that we recognize God's calling upon these men's lives. So these men were prayed over and it was recognized publicly that they were gifted to serve practically. Does God take service in every part of the church seriously? What's the answer? So everything we do, we do as unto the Lord. Is it my turn in the children's ministry? If that's your attitude, please stop. Amen? It should be a get to, not a have to. I get to serve God this week. I, it's my, I can't wait. I'm excited about this. Amen? Mrs. Green, who led me to the Lord at the First Baptist Church in Wilmington, when you went to her house, she had pictures of every kid in her children's ministry on her fridge, and she prayed for them every day. That's called calling. Amen? When it's a get-to, when it's a joy, I can't believe I get to do this. The laying on of hands. We recognize God's calling upon these people's lives. What a powerful picture. Amen? And God loves those who faithfully serve him. Then it said, now watch the result. So they raise up these seven guys. They start handling all the practical ministries. They start dealing with some of the disputes among the people. What is the result? Look at verse seven. This is a great verse. It's underlined in my Bible. Then the word of God spread and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Some of the priests who had cried out, crucify him of Jesus Christ, were now getting saved. Why? Because the church was functioning the way it was supposed to. Those who were called to preach the word of God and study the word of God focused on that. Those who were called to serve in practical ways focused on that. And as a healthy church is functioning in the way that it should, the healthy church grows and has an impact on the cities around it. Amen? For bickering with each other, If everybody's sitting back just waiting to be served, guess what? The church won't be as effective as it should be. Amen? So faithful men have been raised up. Faithful people are serving. The church is growing. God is being glorified. Apostles place 100% of their ministry on the focus to the word. The word of God spread. The number dissolved. So we went from addition to multiplying to multiplying greatly. The church just keeps growing. Now, how many fancy buildings they got to write about now? They got a petting zoo out in the parking lot. Bozo the Clown there, they're handing out free cheeseburgers. I mean, what are they doing to grow the church? They're teaching the word of God, amen? And it doesn't have to be a fancy building. It doesn't have to be the most comfortable chairs, amen to that. It doesn't have to be, you know, just, they were just meeting wherever and God was blessing the church and the church was growing and magnifying, and praise God, amen? 
Our church in Santa Cruz, I loved it because we met in a gymnasium with metal chairs. You know those old metal chairs that are all rusty and falling apart and they're just pain, they're like a, a torture, right? It's a form of torture. That's what our people sat in. And the place was freezing in the winter and burning hot in the summer. And when we started meeting there, it was 10 people. And when we left that building, it was 900. And there was no stained glass. The parking lot was often muddy. It was in a bad location. The word of God transforms people's lives. Amen? And guys, it's more of God's word. It's more of the power of God's word. But it's not just one or two people using their gifts. It's when the whole body uses their gifts that the church is multiplied and the kingdom is added to. Amen? When's the last time you invited someone to church? When's the last time you stepped out in faith to use the gifts God's given you? I just don't know what to. You know what? That's when it's faith, because you don't want to. Amen? I did not want to teach six teenage girls the Bible. I'm just being, I showed up, I dab, I dab. I'm glad there are no tapes of any of that stuff. <laughs> That'd be blackmail material. Amen? This is your pastor. Oh my goodness. The reality is, though, that when you step out and you get stretched, you grow. Amen? And I would rather have it be a little sloppy and make a few mistakes than sit back and do nothing. Amen? So they didn't have any peppy PowerPoint presentations, but because of God's word and transforming of lives, it increased their love for the Lord, increased their faith in him. It gave them a supernatural love for others, and the same is true for us. It'll cause us to be contagious. When you grow in your knowledge of God's word, our love for him grows, our faith in him grows. You want to fall in love with Jesus? Just spend time reading about him, and you will. The more time you spend with him, to know him is to love him, and to read his word is to know him better, and the better you know him, the more you're going to love him, and the more that you love him, the more your faith is going to grow in him. Amen? I was talking to Pastor Don McClure, who was my pastor yesterday, about some things, and he, I love one of his statements. He says, I don't like it when I'm comfortable. I love to be desperate. When I get too comfortable, it's time to go do something else, and I thought, you know, it is a good place to be desperate. We don't like it, but it's a good place to be. Amen? You know what that means? I have to trust God. If I'm too comfortable, there's tons of money in the bank, everybody's healthy, there's no trials in the marriage, no trials with the kids, everything's great, I don't have any... Dip Sometimes you get complacent. But you know what? When you're going through difficulty, when you're walking through the valley, the shadow of death, you're hanging on to the Savior with both hands. Amen? So desperation's a good place to be. Share God's love and peace in the midst of turmoil, and you can do that only if you know the Prince of Peace. So... When you study the Word of God, when you walk in the Word, when you're learning from the Word, we grow individually and the church grows as well. And a great many priests were obedient to the faith, from religious rituals to a true relationship. Men who were once self-righteous and hostile to the gospel were humbled and brought to repentance through the power of God's Word. Amen. Years ago, I was, we had a thing where a lot of the pastors would get together in Santa Cruz, and some of the guys that were very liturgical, that I just was convinced these guys aren't even, I'm, I'm, I'm wonder if they're saved. It was all about liturgy. And when you'd go out, what's going on in your church? And you get, man, people are getting saved. God's doing this, God's doing this. You get to them, oh, we all got new robes. And we're, really, bro, that's the highlight of the month. Something's wrong, amen? And God, I ended up being roomed with one of these guys. And we started talking. We started talking about the Lord. We started talking about the Word of God. And then he started coming to our Wednesday night Bible study. And I believe it's there that he got saved. Then he ended up turning over the church to one of my assistant pastors that became a Calvary chapel and it exploded. And that man's walking with the Lord. You can be religious and lost. And religion doesn't save you. It's a relationship with the Lord. Let's look at the rest of this. I've got 12 minutes. Here we go. And if I go over, where are you going? <laughs> Verse 8. Says so the first thing we saw is responding to the physical needs, now being available to be used by God as he chooses. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Wait a minute, you just said he was a waiter of tables. What happened? He was available to be used in the practical, so God is using him in the spiritual. Amen? He was, uh, here I am, Lord, I'll, you can use me. I'll do it. Lord, I'm ready. 
Stephen began with a heart willing to serve, empowered by the Holy Spirit. He didn't place limits on how God would use him. He did signs and wonders which authenticated his ministry, and those signs and wonders became an opportunity for the gospel. This was power that was previously limited to the apostles, but he had a heart for both the pantry and the pulpit, as my dad would say. He had a heart to do the practical and was available when spiritual opportunities came. It says, full of faith and power. Ministry is authenticated, in this case, by signs and wonders, but faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, and the word power there is the Holy Spirit upon him. Faith speaks of of, uh, Stephen's heart, and the power is God's response. He had a heart to serve God, and God poured out the power on him to do it. Amen? Amen? And I love the simplicity of Stephen. And all people say, well, the, all the gifting died with the apostles because only the apostles could do stuff. Uh, read this verse, Stephen's not an apostle. Amen? Yes. There, I'm not going to get into it. There's a thing called cessationism where, the, where all, the, all the gifts died with the apostles because we don't need that anymore. And it just all died. And you know, most people that I know that are like that are not very happy. Amen? I have the joy of the Lord. Does God still heal people? What's the answer? Is it God almighty, all-powerful God? Yes. So praise God. Amen. Now, some of the gifts are abused, and so because some are abused, people run to the other extreme. But guys, we believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, and we also believe the Holy Spirit is not the author of confusion. Amen? So everything will be done decently and in order, but God's gifts are still for today. Now, notice what it says. Then there arose from what is called the synagogue of freedmen, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those of Cilicia and Asia disputing with Stephen. By the way, when you make a stand for God, doesn't mean everybody's going to agree. Amen? When you stand up for the Lord and you preach with boldness, oh, I'm going to preach with, I'm going to go share my faith at work tomorrow, and the whole building's going to get saved. And then we're going to have a Bible study. It's going to be amazing. We're going to change the name of the business to honor Jesus. It's all, and you know what? God could do that, but more than likely, there's going to be some people that don't like it. And guess who they're going to go after? The messenger. Amen. But I found it to be true that if I'm speaking with boldness often enough, I'm going to face some opposition. If you've never faced opposition, you need to speak up more. Amen. So it says here, freedmen, descendants of Jewish slaves enslaved in Rome, Cyrenians, men of Cyrene, city in North Africa, Alexandrians is another North African city near the mouth of the Nile, a place of great education, so some very educated people. Well, you just preached about Jesus, but we're very educated, and because we're educated, we're going to talk you down. Proclaiming to be wise, they become as fools. Amen? The arrogance. My college professors... A bunch of arrogant guys that needed Jesus. Every one of them. Well, you know, I've got my PhD, and I'm piled higher and deeper, by the way. But I say, I got my PhD, and I'm this, and I got my. And education's great. But if you put your faith in education, you're putting your faith in being educated by people who largely don't know the Lord. Guess where the real power comes from? The Holy Spirit. Did Jesus raise up Pharisees to follow him, or did he raise up fishermen? Now, do, do schoolwork, work hard. I have a hard time having my kids being influenced eight hours a day by people who hate God. Amen? Amen. So praise God for Christian teachers. We got, seven, we got Christian professors and Christian teachers in this room. Praise God for you. Amen to that. And we need those people. But I want you to see that people are coming against Stephen. Now what's interesting it says there, Cilicia in Asia, Paul's hometown of Tarsus was located right next to Cilicia, and he's probably attending this synagogue where he's speaking, because we know in the next chapter, when Stephen is stoned, there's a man by the name of Saul of Tarsus holding the men's coats who were throwing the rocks, who would later become the Apostle Paul. And guess who's preaching it when Paul hears it? It's Stephen, the table waiter. Amen. It's Stephen, the man who's willing to serve in the practical ways in the church. Because guess what, guys? When you go to work tomorrow and somebody has a question about the Bible, your pastor's probably not going to be there. So guess who gets to be the one who shares the spiritual truth? Billy Graham's probably not coming to your office tomorrow or to your school. So guess who it gets to be you? Amen? And so these people surround him. They're coming against him. So it says he went away and cried and threw a fit. That's not what happened. What happens? There's a diverse crowd. They're all united in one thing. They're debating of Stephen. 
He's preaching with boldness. They don't agree with it. They attack him. Verse 10. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Praise God, amen? Amen. He takes a guy who's a waiter of tables and he's speaking to all these very intellectual people. He's speaking to all these high-end people. He's speaking with people with positions and power and authority and they could not resist the simple truth of the gospel spoke with boldness and wisdom. Amen? Amen? Guys, that's the same thing that happens today. Do you know when you show up at work, the Holy Spirit just showed up? Amen? And do you know when you're speaking to a group of people that don't know the Lord, you're the one in the circle that has the wisdom? Because the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Amen? We shouldn't be arrogant. We're one beggar leading another beggar to the bread. But guys, they need to hear from you more than you need. I want to hear what they have to say just so I can share with them the truth and the hope that lies within us. Now, people were responding. They couldn't resent it, resist it. But look at verse 12. Then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. Now, the people that heard it, some responded, but most resisted. They're resisting the word of God. And it's, they were they were and. Because they had nothing to accuse him with, they had to make up false accusations. Whose trial does that sound like? Jesus. Remember, they paid people off to lie about him. You know, when you're standing for the Lord and you're telling the truth and the wisdom of God, it's irrefutable. And what happens is some people don't want to hear it, so they'll bring up false accusations against you. Welcome to the club. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you for my name's sake, for so they did the prophets who went before you. Amen? I'm really bummed because you're getting after me at work. No, you're blessed because God's using you. Amen? They target him with false accusations. They're going to accuse him of blasphemy, which is punishable by death. Look what it says in verse 12. It says, we heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. Is that true? What's the answer? You know who speaks blasphemous words against Moses? Everybody who rejects Jesus. Amen? Verse 12, and they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and they came upon him and seized him and brought him to the council. They stirred up the people. They seized him. They brought him. They arrested Jesus in Gethsemane and they brought him before Annas and Caiaphas. Again, popular opinion does not equal truth. Can you say amen to that? Just because the world says it's true doesn't mean it's true. Just because they voted on it and, and the, po- you know, the popular vote says it's okay to have homosexual marriage doesn't mean it's okay. God defines marriage, amen? And we love the homosexual people, want to see them saved. But the word of God is, a, is the final court of authority when it comes to everything. But well, we voted and we just don't believe that. Doesn't matter. If you vote that there's no gravity, you step off a building, what happens to you, Amen. Notice what it says there. They also set up false witnesses who said, this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place in the law. We've heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. Well, Jesus did say, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. Well, what temple was he talking about? His body. By the way, AD 70 is coming and the temple is coming down. Amen. But there was an arrogance. They were making false accusations and they're calling him in. They're going to do what they can. You know, we've heard him say the same charges that false witnesses again brought against Jesus and destroy it and raise it up. Fulfilled again at this point. And it says, and change the customs. Well, it's a half truth and half truth is a lie. The Bible says Jesus did not come to do away with the law, but to fulfill it. Now, do we still offer sacrifices? What's the answer? So are we still under the Old Covenant? What's the answer? Okay, but does that mean that the Old Testament is of no value? What's the answer to that? Of course it is. It's the Word of God. Jesus fulfilled it. It's all the Word of God. We stand by all of it. Amen? Some of it was fulfilled in Christ. We're not dragging lambs here anymore. Jesus died on the cross. He said it's finished. Final verse. And all who said in the council looked steadfastly at him. Now watch this. And saw his face as the face of an angel. He was glowing in the dark for Jesus. Amen? They were accusing him of speaking against Moses. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai, what had happened to his face? It was glowing. It was shining because he'd been with the Lord. And guess what? 
They're accusing him of speaking against Moses, and I think God has a sense of humor. <laughs> You're against Moses, and all of a sudden, he's glowing like Moses. Don't you love it? Amen? And I believe that while we're, our faces may not glow, one of my sister-in-laws was at the memorial service. And my older brother's been married twice, and now he's been with someone else for a while. And his second wife, the last I heard of her, she was struggling with drugs, and her life was kind of a mess. And she showed up at the memorial service. I had not seen her in probably 10 years. And she walked in the door, and I knew that she'd been saved just by looking at her. She had such a, a countenance of joy. She just looked like a different person. And I walked over and I said, Alicia, I said, you look amazing. You're doing, man, wow. I said, the Lord's got a hold of you. And she said, as your dad would say, I've been saved real good. <laughs> and she's just a different person. And you know what? When you give your life to Jesus Christ, people are going to see it in you. Amen? Amen? Even unbelievers will recognize there's something different about you. Nobody could dispute. They saw him and he was radiating because he was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he was being obedient to the Word of God, and he was speaking with boldness, but doing it in love at the same time. I pray that we would live such a way that when we're at work, people say, what's different about you? There's something different. And then we can say, it's Jesus. Amen? Amen. Teaching at school, and they say, you can't talk. what's different about you, teacher? It's Jesus. What's different about you, your coworkers? It's Jesus. Because, guys, he changes us all. Amen? So, raising up godly servants. As the church grows, there's a need for servants. We respond to the physical needs in the body by recognizing the need and having a heart to serve. When we raise up godly servants, we need people who will be available to be used by God no matter how he chooses. When we're available, he empowers us by the Holy Spirit. And like Stephen, what happens? Because he was just available, he did great signs and wonders. He spoke with godly wisdom, and his face shone like the face of an angel. You hear me say it often, let's be the moon. What does the moon do? It reflects the sun. It's a reflection of the S-U-N, amen? And we should be reflections of the S-O-N, amen? Yes. Guys, if we want to see revival, if we want to see this church have a greater impact on the community around it. By the way, a lot of people have gotten saved in this room, and praise God for that. And whatever God chooses to do, that's up to Him. But we need to be faithful to our calling so that God might be glorified, Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you, we love you. You are indeed a great and awesome God. You're so worthy to be worshipped, to be praised, and to be honored. I pray for everyone here this morning, if you have been stirring us, stirring us up that you have a greater calling upon our lives, a greater calling to be obedient to, to the gifting you've given us. If you're stirring people up to step out in faith, even if they don't even know what the gift is yet, but just feel a calling that, Lord, I know you want me to do more than I'm doing. Lord, I pray even right now you would just by your Holy Spirit confirm that in their hearts and give them an extra measure of boldness, give them a hunger for your word and help them, Lord, to step out in faith, to go beyond their comfort zone. You know, I planned on doing this. If you're here this morning and you feel like the Lord was really ministering to your heart that you need to be doing more, that God has a specific calling for you to do more than you're doing now for the kingdom of God, I just want you to stand up and I want to pray for you. Anybody at all. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you guys. God bless you guys. Your Heavenly Father, you see those who stand, and Lord, I just pray, as they stand before you, confessing, Lord, I know there's more you want to do with me. Lord, that you would make it clear to them what those things are, that you would stir up the gifts you've given them, and you would use them in a mighty and a powerful way to reach their sphere of influence, to be used here in this local church. Lord, to take those gifts and use them for your kingdom and for your glory. I pray the Lord, as they step out in faith, even when they're fearful or even nervous, Lord, that you would meet them there and give them the strength to do what you've called them to do. Lord, bless them as they acknowledge, Lord, here I am, send me. Use me, Lord. Bless them, Lord. Use them in a mighty and a powerful way. We ask these things in your holy and your precious name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. let's stand up and worship the Lord. Is he worthy to be worshiped? Is he worthy to be worshiped?